record to the computer. This meeting is being recorded. All right, perfect. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> my name is David Smallwood, and I work for the Dallas Zoo. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be able to talk to you today about, um, well, we'd be doing a math walk, a STEM walk. And I really want to talk about Talk STEM before I even begin, because I believe it to be a great program. All right, so Talk STEM, if you don't already know, is an organization that is focused on uh, furthering uh, STEM as far as kids learning. Ki um, females like are very underrepresented in the STEM fields, right? And there's uh, a lot of different uh, marginalized aspects and people in uh, the STEM fields. All right, and it's, it's very close to my heart because uh, I'm, I'm a STEM educator. I started um, teaching STEM, uh, I guess it'd be six years ago, I, I taught elementary STEM in Arlington ISD. And I know how important it is because uh, in the next five years, I believe it's gonna be like 1.6 million STEM jobs opening up. And, and these careers are awesome. If you like video gaming, if you like animals, if you like uh, my degree, let's, let's talk a little bit about me before I go into this. All right, my degree uh, personally uh, is in uh, applied science graphic art. So I'm an artist. And uh, but I'm a computer artist and I can draw on the computers. I can I can help create. I've helped create video games. I've helped uh, create graphics that you might have seen in magazines or on television and billboards. And I get a joy out of doing that. It's like taking uh, the traditional art form and putting it in a STEM environment and uh, lots of different art forms and lots of different jobs are doing that nowadays. And uh, I recently was uh, under the weather for a period of time and I couldn't go out anywhere. I couldn't go out to get anything. And through STEM uh, um, jobs such as like the apps, like Uber Eats and things like that, I was able to get all my groceries delivered to me. So like the era that we live in is amazing right now. Now, uh, my first job ever was at the Audubon Zoo in New Orleans. I was 12 years old. I, I, uh, I volunteered to teach people about animals. And my science teacher was the one who got me that job as a summer job. And I was very enthusiastic about it. I didn't know that it would lead to, uh, to what I'm doing today, but I worked that job all the way to when I was 17. Then I joined the US Army and I worked a science job there. I was a chemical operations specialist. So I learned all about different chemicals and different uh, biological, nuclear, and chemical uh, agents that could be used. Uh, and I learned how to help our troops by uh, decontaminating them. And I learned weather patterns and things like that. So after the army, I went to college and I learned about the graphic design that I was telling you about. And then after that, I went on to doing uh, education. And I really love education because I like teaching people what I consider to be like things that I'm interested in. And that's what Talk STEM does. It teaches about um, lots of different STEM walks and different things. I want. I wish I could share my screen. Let me see if I could share my screen just to um, go to their website right quick. And I will scroll down as I do it, okay? Here we go. All right, let me share it right quick. Here we go, one time. And for those just joining us, we're doing some creative workarounds on the technology that David is sharing uh, what the Talk STEM website looks like just to introduce you all. But when he's screen sharing, microphone doesn't work. So we're working through these things. <laughs> but this is freely accessible to anyone who, um, who is interested to learn more about the programs that Talk STEM offers that David's gonna share more about what it actually looks like with the Dallas Zoo at this time. All right, so like with us, um, since we're doing it virtually, uh, I have a couple of videos that I wanna share and the emphasis of the video is to show that there's math visually all around us, even at the zoo. Like I know STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. And the science parts get a lot of attention, but math is the physical language of science. And so um, I have some videos that I wanna share and while the videos are going on, I want you to ask yourselves uh, what, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna show you a screen, um, but um, I, I want you to ask yourself what math question is being asked in the video and what was the solution given to the math problem? And as you look through the videos, I would like for you to start thinking of some math um, problems that you can, or questions that you can come up with yourself as you look at the video. And 
it's a it's a process to learn how to do this because like first when we think about math and we uh like think about the zoo like i know every animal at the zoo is my job too so i can tell you all kinds of facts like that the elephants weigh this or or that they're this tall or that the giraffes weigh this or that they're tall but uh, i just want you to focus on what you can see and that's what the videos are going to do so i'm going to start my first video and this part i could share and we'll go over it and then we'll learn more about the process after we go over it. So, all right, I'm gonna share my screen right now and it's gonna be the video. All right, so sharing my audio and my video, here we go. Here's a tough question. What do animals like elephants, giraffes, cats, dogs, what do they have in common besides just being mammals? Hmm, I'm not sure. Well, they all walk on four legs. These types of animals are called quadrupeds because quad means four in Latin. Have you ever wondered what type of walking pattern quadrupeds use? Do they all share the same walking pattern or do they walk differently? That's actually a great math question. Did you know mathematics is also the science of patterns? A math pattern is simply a repeated arrangement of anything, numbers, colors, shapes, and so on. You can have number patterns or any other kind of pattern too. So let's figure out what the walking pattern, also known as the gait pattern, is among quadrupeds, and even if there's a single pattern common to them all. And when we get home, let's observe our four-legged friends and see if they walk like our animals here at the zoo do. A lot of us look at four-legged animals, like this elephant here at the Dallas Zoo, or my cat walking at home, scampering and galloping every day. But it's really hard to really see a pattern quickly with just the human eye. Let's try. I bet if we focused on carefully noticing, we could discover a pattern that describes how each quadruped moves, and we could also see if they have a common walking pattern. That's right. It's a little confusing to talk about the sequence of leg movements in a four-legged animal, so how about we make it easier to communicate? We could name each leg in this elephant, or in name the front left leg a one and the front right leg a two. And I'm thinking that we can do the same with the hind legs, except call the back left leg a three and the back right leg a four. Great. So now that we have named each of the quadruped's legs, I feel like we're ready to compare different animals. Watch carefully. Which one moves first? The back left leg went first, then the front leg. Interesting. So we start with a three and then go to one. And then the back right leg steps up and then the front right leg. So we can add a four and a two. Nice. So then our pattern becomes three, one, four, two, over and over again. That's back left, then front left, back right, then front right. This is our repeating core, three, one, four, two. Yes, this repeating pattern that we just made is called a quadruped's gait. No matter what four-legged animal we look at in the animal kingdom, we can find the same walking pattern of three, one, four, two across species. I wonder why though. The reason for this is that quadrupeds have all evolved to develop a walking pattern that provides the maximum static stability. That means when walking slowly, the animal's body is always supported by their having three of their feet on the ground, forming a triangle. Did you know that the triangle is the strongest shape of all shapes? So it has a strong base and provides immense support. What about when the animals are walking really fast or running? When different animals move fast, when they gallop or canter or run, their gait patterns may vary a little, but again, there are some repeating patterns you would notice. Thinking about math and walking patterns makes me think about it in music as well. I play the guitar at home, and I definitely can produce different tunes simply by changing the pattern without having to change the notes. I wonder what other things in our everyday life could be described just by using math patterns. I have a feeling math patterns are everywhere around us. You just have to notice them. All right, so now I think I figured the zoom out a little bit better, but um, could anybody tell me what was the math question asked in the video? Thank you, Gotti Grant. All right, so I can tell you that the uh, math question asked in the video is um, 
what patterns do quadruped, uh, quadrupeds um, use when they walk? And uh, can anybody tell me what the answer was? You can type it in chat if you want. Three, one, four, two. Yes, like, yes, three, one, four, two. And, um, and another way that um, you could do that is like a triangle um, pattern. Like it makes a triangle when they walk. And uh, that's, that's quadrupeds. That's a, that's a vocabulary word that I use a lot here. It means to walk on four legs. And yes, that's what it is. Uh, now, looking at the video, do you think that you could come up with any other math questions, like your own math questions? All right. Oh, you do, Grant? Do you think you got something? All right. Well, um, you can uh, put it in chat or you can uh, unmute yourself and hit. Let me see if I could unmute you. And you can say it. Um. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Sometimes when you get on camera, it's kind of kind of hard to do. But I think I figured out this whole um this uh the Zoom meeting. So I, I now know how to share. It's just like right now you see yourself. So um when if I go to this screen right here and let me see, click on right here and then go back here. Oh no, it won't let me do it. So um we're still out with that, but all right. So yes, we, we got that answer of the question. And like, as you walk around, if, even if you look in your room, you should be able to see math patterns around. Like she said, you could probably do it with music and you could do it with like, if you have any pets at home, like it's just visually what you see because math is all around. Like even that teddy bear that Grant just held up, uh, you could do math, um, math questions with that. Like if I was looking, I could say, how many stripes does that tiger have? And you can, you can figure it out. You can, you can do it in different ways. Uh, I have another video that I want to show you that kind of deals a little bit with that. Uh, and I'm going to see if I can click it right now. And then I'm going to start it playing, okay? Let's see. His name is Fire Chase. Okay. I've always loved watching animals here at the mixed species habitat, but I wonder, can we measure their behavior? And if so, are there any map patterns connected to it? Yes, we can measure animal behavior. David, the screen's not on yet. Oh, okay, was I not sharing? I'm sorry, let me no, see. No, I could hear it, but it wasn't sharing. I've always loved watching animals here at the mixed species habitat, but I wonder, can we measure their behavior? And if so, are there any math patterns connected to it? Yes, we can measure animal behavior, which is really helpful if we want to learn more about the way an animal lives and how to help it if there's a problem. If you think about it, behavior is basically just how the animal interacts with its environment or with others. I've heard that mathematicians are working right now with animal biologists to study that behavior and measure it. It's so cool to see all these new studies of field come alive. Exactly. In fact, the beginning point of searching for patterns in animal behavior is to measure and track animal behavior using something called an ethogram. An ethogram is a catalog or table of different kinds of behavior being observed in an animal. Then you can look for patterns of behavior in the data collected in the ethogram. Let's take a look at an ethogram. Here's an example of an ethogram. This is the same one that the zoo uses for their elephants. It's for a 10 minute observation that is split into 10 one minute intervals. So each time that the stopwatch tells the researcher it's been one minute, they record the information. The animal researchers are interested in collecting these specific data about elephants. Take a look at these categories. The categories include movement or locomotion, location in the habitat, distance from other elephants, and specific behaviors. Let's look at a sample data set for Gypsy the elephant. So just by looking at the location data, Gypsy started out in the pool and moved over to near the fig tree in the first five minutes. Here's a map of the area. So Gypsy moved along this area in the first five minutes. Near the bottom of the ethogram, we can see that for each category, like behaviors, locomotion, and so forth, there were a total of 10 observations recorded within this 10 minute observation of Gypsy the elephant. And they converted her activities into percentage, which is very useful. There's a lot you can do with this ethogram data to look for Gypsy's behavioral patterns. Here's a bar graph showing her activity budget over the 10 minute observation. <laughs> Looks like Gypsy really likes to eat. I can imagine that as the animal researchers gathered lots of ethogram data for her, they could know if this was a consistent pattern. 
where she spends the bulk of her time eating, or if there's certain times of the day she likes to eat most, or even if the amount of time spent eating changes as she gets older? Yes, isn't it cool that when you see the ethogram data, you get lots of questions in your mind? And by gathering more ethogram data, you can start to answer them and understand the math patterns that Gypsy and other elephants follow. Here are Gypsy's location preferences. Looks like she liked spending most of her time near the barn or near the fig tree. And here are Gypsy's locomotion rates in a pie chart. The chart is a helpful visual tool, like the graphs were, to look for patterns. It looks like she liked standing mostly, at least for this 10 minute observation window. Finally, here's a bar graph showing how close she was to the other elephants. Looks like 30% of the time she was quite close to another elephant. I'd really like to see more data based on Gypsy's behavior. She really likes to interact with Jenny. Same with Congo and Kamba. They really love playing with one another. And Ajabu, our five-year-old male, loves to spend time with his mom and the rest of the females in the herd. That is just awesome that you know so much about all of these behavioral patterns. All because you take the time to observe and measure information in a systematic way using ethograms. You can even use ethograms at home with your pets. Doesn't that sound like fun? Oh yeah, we could come up with a generic ethogram to do that. Here's an example of one. You could also add other categories based on what you're interested in measuring. I definitely need to add sleep as a category for my dog. He loves sleeping and there'd be a bunch of intervals for that. Unless you say the word cookie, of course. Even my fish moves differently when I feed it. I could track its swimming pattern. Never even thought about that. You're so right. Math helps us predict and measure animals' behaviors, which helps us help them. So that video was cool. Uh, what, um, can anybody tell me what question was asked? All right. Patterns and behavior. Yes, patterns and behaviors. All right, so I didn't get a chance to tell you all about what my job is at the zoo. All right, so my job at the zoo is to, uh, I work in the education department as a conservation interpreter. And so um, my job is to teach people about every animal in the zoo, but especially the conservation efforts that are being made for those animals. So Gypsy, the elephant in the video is actually one of my favorite animals to talk about because uh, she's the same age as me, she's 40 years old. But uh, an ethogram is a good way to to track animal behavior and all the uh, zoologists at the zoo use those um, in different ways. We actually have an activity that we do with the kids who come up here uh, to the zoo for our camps um, when you make your own ethogram. Like an ethogram is a great way to track behaviors and it's a, it's, it's a, a math principle uh, because you observe behaviors over a set pattern of time. And so if you're looking at her for 10 minutes, uh, you would see that she likes to hang out by the tree or she likes to hang out with her best friend, Jenny. And uh, it's a good way of learning what the animal that you're dealing with likes and how you can better um, make their life uh, happier here at the zoo. And uh, I just filled out an ethogram about one of our goats because I work in the children's zoo. So if you have time at home, there's templates to download uh, for ethograms. So if you wanted to do an ethogram on your pet or something like that, it's good practice and you could do that. All right, so I wanna show another video. Uh, and this video is going to be, this month is January, and at the zoo, our conservation effort for the month is uh, the African penguin. And this video is about to be about the, the African penguin. So uh, I, re I really think y'all will enjoy this one. So I'm going to share that one. All right. And share video. Share. <laughs> Did you know that, sadly, the number of African penguins has been dwindling for decades? This is mostly due to overfishing and climate change and harvesting of guano, or penguin poop. African penguins make their nests in heaps of dried guano that has been built up over decades, providing the perfect temperature control and protection for raising young chicks. But guano is also a really good fertilizer because it's high in nitrogen, so people started harvesting it leaving African penguins without enough building material for their nests. That's horrible. So do the penguins not have nests in the wild to raise their young? Well, to help with this problem, the Dallas Zoo is actually a participant in the SAFE African Penguin Artificial Nest Project. Wow. Let me guess. So the group of engineers made nests for the penguins to use out in the wild since there's not enough guano to build their nests? Exactly. 
Now, I wonder if there's a mathematical pattern to the way penguins use their nests in South Africa. These engineered nests can actually help answer our question. There are about 1,400 of these engineered nests in South Africa, and there are about 100 nests in each penguin colony. So we do have a lot of data for egg lay dates and counts in the penguin colonies. Each nest is checked on a weekly basis, and the number of eggs is recorded. So we could look to see if there's a pattern. Okay, so if it is true that most species have an annual breeding season, I bet there are some months of the year that penguins are laying lots of eggs. That's right. What is the best way to figure this problem out? What if we had a graph or chart that shows us the number of eggs in all the engineered nests? Great idea. A graph is a great way to find math patterns. If we had a graph with two axes, one for the month of the year and the other for the number of eggs found in the nest that month, we could look and see if we could identify a pattern in the graph. We could then figure out which months of the year penguins lay the most eggs. This graph looks like it has a lot of curves in it. And there are different graphs for the different locations, it looks like. That's right. It looks like we have data for four different locations here. In mathematics, that type of line graph can be called a curve, and it has a wave-like property. Whoa, wave-like properties sound really cool, but what does that mean? It means that the graph has a series of well-defined low points, or minimums, and high points, maximums. So by figuring out the minimums and maximums, we can also figure out which months of the year penguins are laying their eggs and which months they aren't. Exactly, good observation. What do you see? Well, it seems like the high points on the graph are happening during March and April and September and October. True, and the low points seem to be in June and July and January and February. And we can see that this pattern is similar across all four locations. So to answer your question, yes, there is a pattern to which the penguins use their nests to lay eggs. The maximums and minimums tell us a lot of information. In this case, we were able to find out at which points penguins are most likely to lay their eggs and which months they aren't. In mathematics, a pattern is a set of numbers arranged in a sequence such that they are related to each other in a specific rule. Here, the rule is that the numbers follow this annual cycle that we discovered in our graphs. I wonder what other patterns we could find in penguins or other living things if we had the data, like maybe how a penguin grows from chick to adult, or at what age it grows the most, I wonder. Yeah, I bet you could. There's math patterns everywhere. It's fun to discover them with your pets at home, here at the zoo, or even with your own activities and movements. Okay, everybody. So I, like, I especially like that video, but um, can anybody tell me what was the... Uh, Math question in that video? All right. All right. I can tell you if you don't. Uh, the, the math question was, um, what, pattern, what math patterns can we discover in the ways that penguins use uh, their nest in South Africa? Um, right now, actually, uh, Kevin uh, Graham, the person who put that, um, that information together, is in Africa right now. He works with me in the same office. He's, he just flew to South Africa. Uh, couple of weeks ago, and they're right now doing that same study currently. Uh, but um, let's try to think of some other questions that we could come up with the penguins in the area in the video that we saw. Could you think of any questions that you can come up, math questions, from just what you saw in the video? Like, I know, like, in the video, I saw some penguins were in the water and some were out, and like one area that I would like to um, find out more information on is how much time do penguins actually spend in the water? That'd be a good math question right there. Uh, because uh, even though some were on land, some were in water. And so I guess I could do an ethogram about that and that would show a great pattern. Uh, let's see. And the same way that they did the, the graph and showed that throughout the month, certain months of the year, uh, the penguins laid, uh, had a high lay rate in certain months of the year, they had a lower lay rate. Anybody remember that part of the video? Uh, how certain months were higher and certain months were lower? Yes. And what what are they doing during that time? All right. To... So during that time, uh, like, all right. So this is 
information more that I know um, that they didn't share on the video is um, during those low late, uh, times, they actually go out to sea and they, they're hunting during those times. So almost all those penguins, like it's, it could be uh, hundreds of thousands of them, like, well, thousands of them uh, out at sea at the same time. And then they come back and they find their same mate. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's a thousand penguins on the beach. Uh, they know through special calls and stuff who's their mate. So like uh, you can see the cycles of how they go out and feed. So uh, when they land, uh, it's during those warm months. And like sometimes like in the cooler times, they're out there in the sea and they're, they're hunting. And they spend large amounts of time hunting in the sea and months at a time. So that's that's a good observation that you had, uh, Renice. Um, so, Evan and um, Gabby in the chat are saying we the, a good question would be how long do they sleep? Yeah, how long do they sleep? That is a good question to ask. And uh, I I don't have information on that, but yeah, that's a good thing. I, I can actually go and find out more information on that. That's a good question. Uh, how long do they sleep? Like. Uh, I have a lot of people who ask me questions about like uh, the lions and stuff. They're like, they're always sleeping when I see them. How long do they sleep? I know factually the lions in the wild sleep 21 hours out of the day. And so, uh, so I can find out more information on that. That's a perfect question. How long do they sleep? You can measure the hours and um, do the same type of graph that they did for that. The bar, um, you can make two axes about times when they're awake and time when they're asleep. How deep is their swimming pool? Uh, yeah, that's a measurement. Uh, I can tell you right now that the pool that they have over there is about uh, six and a half feet, right? The one that you saw. How long do they eat? Uh, how long do they eat? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the penguins are fed twice a, um, twice a day. And uh, they're fed uh, in the morning at uh, 1130. And I believe again in the afternoon around uh, uh, 230 or 3 o'clock. So yeah. So that's a good question to ask too. All right, so y'all are getting it. So if y'all were here walking around the zoo, y'all would get it. Like as you're going around and looking at things, you can see, hey, uh, your brain will start thinking, what kind of math uh, questions can I have? A lot of the questions that people do ask are math questions. Like a lot of the questions I get are, how many babies do they have at a time? Or how, how much hours do they sleep? How fast do they run? Yeah, numbers are big here at the um, Dallas Zoo. And so I'm glad that you are thinking that way. And uh, I want to encourage you again to go to TalkStem's uh, YouTube channel, uh, because on the YouTube channel, they have more videos um, for the Dallas Zoo's uh, area of TalkStem, and it has um, different partners that TalkStem have with it. I do want to talk about how SMU, um, Southern Methodist University, is um, partnered with the um, TalkStem, and they are underneath the, the National um, Science Foundation. and. Uh, all, of the, all of the things that you see on there are quality science STEM uh, activities, and uh, you can do different walks on there. Also on their site, if you um, wanted to uh, have your own um, STEM walk, they could tell you how to do that. And so I encourage everybody to go to that site. Um, and I got a couple of more minutes if anybody has any more questions. Well, Evie popped one in there on the chat. Do penguins have teeth? All right, so penguins don't have teeth. What they do have is ridges in their beaks and it helps them to pull things in, but um, they do not have teeth. Uh, most, I'm trying to think of any bird do I know. No, no bird. Um, um, geese have what looks like teeth on their, on their beaks, but it's just ridges in the beaks. How did you get to work for the zoo? All right, perfect question. You, you, I was supposed to tell you that earlier. It was on one of my slides. Okay, so like I said, I worked for Arlington ISD teaching STEM. And during the summertime, I wanted a summer job. So I, I applied to work at the Dallas Zoo and I was doing it for the summers. And I loved it so much. And they asked me if I wanted to work here full time teaching people about animals and teaching kids about animals in specific. So I said, yeah, so I've been here. Uh, actually, um, this is my first full year here and I'm enjoying it. Great question. And I will say um, here, we have a lot of people with a lot of different degrees. Like uh, we have uh, people who work in my department who have degrees in English and science. We have some uh, people in other departments like zoologists, they have so many degrees in science for that. Like we have people who do ornithology, ethnology, entomology, and these are all dealing with different types of animals like entomology, study of insect or ornithology, birds, and things like that. So uh, I encourage you to look up these things. If you're interested in working at the Dallas Zoo, uh, there's actually um, 
areas like you can come to our camps right now. There's camps for young kids and you can start volunteering as early as 13 at the Dallas Zoo. So uh, yeah, if you're interested in that, you can go to DallasZoo.com and uh, get the information from there. And I can put that in the, uh, the chat if you like to. But uh, that's a good question. How, lo how long do penguins live? All right, so um, penguins live uh, in the zoo uh, is a little bit different, but they can live over 20 to 25 years, different penguins. Like uh, there's over 18 different types of penguins. And the ones that we were talking about today are African penguins. Most people think that penguins all live in cold areas, but only four of the penguins out of the 18 live in cold areas. All the rest of them live in more temporal areas like South Africa, like the penguins that um, we showed today. All right. Do we have any more questions? Um, we have like, it's probably about the end. Um, I have but a I'm, question. Yes, Evie. How long do penguins like, well, how do they manage to like stay warm in cold right. so, environments? So um, penguins are what you call homeothermic. So they're, they're not like, um, ectotherms, which are like cold blooded, which means they have to um, have environmental factors to help with their temperatures. A uh, penguin's temperature stays about the same all the time. So they're homeothermic. They're not endothermic like us, but they're homeothermic. So the temperature stays about the same, which is why they can go into those um, cooler temperatures in the water and um, be on the warm temperatures on the rocks. That's a great question, actually. All right, I'm so glad that you all came. All right, I, I love answering questions. So um, even if the recording stops, if you if you have, I have a little more time to answer questions. If you have any more questions, like I, I love talking about the Dallas Zoo. All right, well, I'm glad you all came today. I, I see in the chat. Uh, I am glad that you all came today and I hope that you get to visit some of the other um, them expo uh, activities today, but thank you for visiting me. You made my day. And now I'm about to go back out here and talk to some people about elephants. So y'all have a wonderful day, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you all. All right, bye.